that was my mentality. And I think the way that I did that was I shifted into my masculine, I disassociated, and I spent the next almost a decade swinging between kind of disassociation, driving really hard, thinking that if I could just achieve and get to where I wanted to get to, I'd feel better. And the other side of that, which was all of the pain that I refused to look at, was smashing me in the face. So I was having panic attacks. I had generalized anxiety disorder. I didn't even know what that was, but um, I was doing quite a lot of drugs and drinking. Hello, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Amy Watson. Now, Amy is an intuitive guide, soul therapist, and a conscious life coach. She offers one to one sessions and programs to help women break through their limitations and consciously create a life they love aligned with their soul purpose, power, and freedom. Let's have a chat with her. Hi, Amy. How are you doing? Hey, honey. Good morning. I'm really good. Thank you. Really good. I'm yeah. so excited about today. I know. Me too. I've been, I've been waiting for, we've been cancelling this for a while, <laughs> but we've been waiting to uh, with you. We've done podcast tag, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when is this happening? <laughs> yeah, it's great. So um, I was just thinking back when we met, we actually met at one of the uh, coaching sort of uh, academy, I think, events, a two-day event. And um yeah, um, and then um, I came across, we put our paths sort of cross again when, where, where was it? It's an online retreat, you were given a uh, guided meditation. Uh, it was yeah, beautiful, yeah. by the way, it was amazing. Oh, thank you so much. I feel like we've zigzagged a few times, actually. And then, yeah, part of that transformation decoded, you've got to know Emma and Mickey and that crew. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a spiritual community. It seems like a really small. Everyone knows each other. <laughs> so yeah, it is tight knit. It's quite yeah, it's quite tight knit for sure. Yeah. So obviously the audiences don't know who you are. I know who you are. But um, could you tell us a bit about yourself, like a brief overview for our listeners? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Um, so it's evolved quite a lot, I'd say, in the last six months. But where I'm at now um, is um. I've trained in yoga and meditation. So I'm a yoga meditation teacher kind of traditionally, but I'm also um, a conscious life coach and soul therapist and intuitive guide. So what that means is I kind of do some of the traditional life coaching stuff, but it's from the soul's perspective. So we go a whole load deeper, rely a lot more into it on intuition, a lot more on kind of the esoteric and energetic side, as well as the more kind of traditional mindset, neuroscience, D mm. stuff. Yeah, amazing. Um, so, you know, like, obviously, when I met you at the Decoded event, uh, online retreat, um, you were given a guided meditation. Now, in our spiritual community, meditation plays a huge part in our lives. Um, and, you know, there, there may be some people who are aware of it. There may be some people who are unaware of it. Um, what is meditation and how can people benefit from it? Oh, great question. I mean, okay, so what is meditation? Meditation for me, and there's many different types, right? But really simply put, is just a stopping doing and just being. Mm. So what that looks like for me is focusing your awareness on one point and watching. It's kind of a shifting from being the person that's doing everything to the one that's just watching. It's almost like a dropping back, a stepping back, a sitting back mm -hmm. into a position of observer. And this can have a myriad of benefits for us. Number one, when do you do that in the day, right? You're so yeah. constantly kind of just doing and in, in the story of your life that there's a real benefit of just creating some space to watch. There's also, I mean, we're human beings, not human doings, right? So to create a bit of space just to be, it's got to be a benefit. For me, it's about creating space where we can watch and get to know ourselves. We can watch our thoughts. We can watch the emotions that are coming up. And the more that we can create that space, it benefits us when we're not meditating, when we're not sat in that, you know, on our meditation cushion or whatever, because it gives us space to be able to observe and then respond in our day-to-day lives. So oftentimes we react kind of unconsciously. It's just knee-jerk subconscious programmings. And for me, meditation has allowed space 
to be able to have that extra second or even a half second where you take a breath before you respond. And that is the absolute pivotal shift to start living more consciously from a place of informed choice rather than just the reactionary subconscious programs that so many of us are in when we're living at that crazy fast pace. Mm, that's beautifully said. I mean, how can people, uh, I know there's a lot of people say, oh, I can't focus, I can't even focus for five minutes. What can they do to bring themselves in that moment? Yeah, great question. I think there's a couple of things. One thing that was a great, um, I suppose, learning for me is there's not one type of meditation. There's not one right way to do it. I think it's a bit of an exploratory journey to figure out what works for you. So some of my clients, they can't sit still. Their meditation is their walk. There's a walking meditation or it's whilst they're running or it's when they're in flow when they're boxing. Um, some people really can't sit because it's uncomfortable. So it's about finding where is that place where you, when you can relax, mm. when you can be in a state of observation and when you can be in a sense of flow. So I think sometimes that takes a little bit of finding, mm. uh, number one. Um, so what was the other side part of that question? So what yeah. would you say to people that say they can't meditate? One, yeah. find it, find, find it, what yeah. works. Yeah, the other is that how can they just sit with it? <laughs> yeah. And that's discipline. So I think for me, it's kind of just giving yourself a break and saying, this isn't meant to be easy. You know, meditation is not about stopping your thoughts. I think there's a really big kind of fallacy out there where we think, right, to meditate well must mean that everything just goes completely silent and we're in the abyss and we become no thing. And yeah, that's possible, but that's to, to start with that expectation is way too much. I think this idea of relaxing is your, your number one first step, starting by taking deeper breaths, you know? So every time, if I lead um, anyone through a meditation, we start with the breath, dropping the breath down into the belly, shifting the sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest. So getting your body relaxed is the first step. So I would say to someone who says, I absolutely can't meditate. My client at the moment, we, we've just done an eight week course and her healing has been through hypno meditative journeying and she told me she couldn't meditate everyone can meditate mm. but the hacks are focus on your breath allow the breath to bring your awareness down into your body from the mind and take the pressure off the belief that you're meant to be having no thoughts mm. and then mm. find wherever feels comfortable for you that might be walking that might be sitting in a quiet room that might be lying down in your bed figure out what works for you and honor that yeah, and it's it's and it kind of um, when you start meditating, um, it brings you in the present moment or automatically you start you don't some people think about other things, but sometimes it, it just quiets your mind automatically once you get the hang of it. But there's another thing as I was uh, reading on or watching, I don't I can't remember I watched so many things. Um, someone mentioned when you can't sit with uh, when you can't meditate, focus on a candle. You don't have to be like a, some like a Zen like like you know person who's like you know okay I need to be in this posture and I need to do this I need to do that and then I need to close my eyes and then it's like and then your mind starts going it's like I'm not doing something right so you can open your eyes and focus on a candle maybe perhaps and when you focus on the candle you're solely focusing on the candle rather than ten ten thousand thousand different thoughts going on in your head. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think what you're hitting on there is that single pointed focus, that single pointed concentration. So pick that one thing that you're going to focus on to begin with. Could be a candle, could be just watching your breath, the whole inhale, the whole out exhale, could be sitting watching the waves when you're sat at a beach or an ocean, mm -hmm. you know. It, but as long as you can, like you said, our mind is jumping around. We have thousands of thoughts a day. Yeah. Just bringing it in and picking one thing, even mm. that is so powerful. Like, yeah. I, you know, I've, I'm just getting in my mind now. It's like we always have all these tabs open in our mind. And meditation feels to me like just closing them all yeah. and picking one and being like, yeah. I'm just going to watch this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I absolutely love it. I mean, I, I it took me a little bit while to get into it, but it was just incredible. I ended up just meditating for like an hour without even realizing that it was an hour. I thought it was like 10 minutes. It's like an hour, but uh, 
Um, yeah. yeah, it's just amazing, amazing. So I, I was reading something the other day actually about um, meditation. Now there are apparently nine different types of meditation. Now I can't remember them all, but it's like there was one focus meditation, guided meditation, yoga meditation. There was a there was other ones. I was like, wow, that is uh, that I've never. I've, I thought I just sit and meditate and that's it. And you know, I knew about guided meditation, but I did not know all different types of. Uh, meditation like you just pointed out you know you can be at, at, at uh, a beach or something watching the waves and that is you are meditating in a way mm-hmm. yeah that's beautiful um I believe I, you can yeah sorry go for it sorry go yeah, no, no, no. what I find super helpful in terms of thinking about those two types of meditation I went and did um a Tibetan Buddhist meditation course when I sort of first started meditating and they split it between kind of what we understand as Vipassana or Vipassana meditation and then kind of more purpose-led meditation Mm -hmm. and that's how we can have so many different purposes to why we meditate essentially we're exploring our internal world but one is we're not really doing anything with it like you said you're dropping into the present moment it's becoming kind of that no thing that's the Vipassana just the watching and then there's a plethora I mean nine nine hundred nine thousand maybe things that we can then do in our internal world as we realize that we are multi-dimensional right mm. Whether that's like compassion meditation forgiveness inner journeying but to keep it simple in my mind is every day I try and just do that stillness that whether you want to call it Vipassana just that watching that one thing the breath and that for me is that's the foundation of my meditation practice that is like yeah the foundation level that I then build my house on to do other crazy things so I'd say to anyone that's starting meditation start with that you don't need anything crazy find one thing to focus on set a time don't negotiate that just set it and do it every day that will build your foundation more than anything else can you go like really deep enough for you to have a spiritual profound spiritual experience have you ever had that in your life yeah, I have. Um, I did. Have you ever done a Vipassana course? No, I haven't. So it's like 10 days and you meditate like 11 hours a day. And you start to experience the kind of truth of reality, which blows your mind. Like we're ni- First of all, we're 99.9% space. Yeah. Two, we're kind of build up of our awareness. That's what's bringing things into existence. And there's an electrical kind of, there's a charge to everything. So yeah, two things that were really profound for me one was feeling my body not as a solid thing but as these charges of electrical current Mm. so it was like I dissolved is how it felt and I could just feel the waves of energy moving through Mm. and then you can feel where the blocks are your subconscious Mm. mind is your body right and I've always had this block on my shoulder it's the last day of Vipassana and I knew it was my mum has the same so it's something ancestral And it's the last day of Vipassana, we're meditating halfway through the day. And it's like, I felt, you know, like if you ever see a bubble coming up through oil, it moves really slowly, like, and it goes at the top. This knot that was like deep in my shoulder suddenly felt like this, this bubble just came to the surface and went, and I literally heard this, and that knot that had been held right underneath my shoulder blade for the whole of my life just completely disappeared. Wow. And I was like, and I couldn't even feel my body as a solid thing. And I was like, this is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is incredible. That is incredible. The most and I get I- is um, when I meditate, when I deep, deeply meditate, I kind of like um, um, feel like feel like I'm moving in like a circle direction or something. Yes. And, and also my forehead starts tingling, like it's just constant tingling on my third eye. It's, in, it's incredible. It's like I can sit here and all the experiences. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's amazing. Once you start to really tap in and get connected, like we're, we're infinite, right? We are part of all that is. So we can go and do anything within our internal worlds. There's many places and experiences I've had because of my own j- internal journeys. And that's what I lead clients through. The beginning and what amazed me and may, might be helpful for people just starting their journey as well. My second one is um, I, I looked after this. This is a bit of a random, but I looked after a cat that was um, hit by a car and he was part, part paralyzed. And I healed and looked after this cat for like three months when I was going through a lot of shit for myself. And I l- love this little thing so mm. much. I mean, he was just trusted me so much. He was just gorgeous. And he totally kept my heart open at a time when it was really broken. 
And when I started meditating, first of all, he used to meditate with me until I left for India and um, mm. he used to sit in purr with me. And when I went to India and ever since until he passed away, I found that thinking of that love for him, and it's, this works with anything, thinking of your true, pure love or gratitude for any personal thing drops you down into your heart space. And for me, it feels like my awareness goes from the kind of churning of my thoughts. It just drops into my heart and my awareness blows right out. Mm -hmm. And it feels like love, gratitude is like the key. It's like the portal to really access your true being mm -hmm. in the present moment in meditation. So I'd say to anyone starting, start with that, really feel into your heart and feel that gratitude. Mm -hmm. And it cool. helps you drop down from the head. Beautiful, beautiful. Do some guided meditation for us, like five minute guided meditation. Sure, let's do um, it. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna meet myself, so. All right, beautiful. So if you guys are listening, I'd invite you just to find a comfortable position, whether that's lying down, whether it's your feet flat on the floor or cross-legged. And first of all, just start by bringing your hands onto your legs with the palms facing upwards. Close down or soften the eyes, whatever feels comfortable for you. And just start by taking a deep inhale through the nose. And as you do, draw the shoulders all the way up towards the ears, squeeze them up. And then exhale, drop them down the back and sigh out through the mouth. <sighs> Allow the forehead to soften, the muscles around the eyes and the jaw, and allow the tongue to peel away from the roof of the mouth. Allow your next inhale to draw down, to draw down through the chest and into the belly so the belly can start to expand, almost like a balloon inflating. And as you exhale, allow the breath to release through the mouth, releasing any stress, any tension. Taking two more breaths like this with the intention to really just start to slow everything down. These next two breaths are gonna be the slowest, the deepest breaths that you've taken all day as you draw the breath in, allowing the belly to expand out. Exhale, release. Final deep inhale as you draw that breath down to the very pit of the stomach the very root of the body. And exhale, allowing any tension, any tightness, any stickiness out with the breath. And I want you to imagine now as the breath returns to its own natural rhythm, that every inhale is like drawing in a beautiful white light you can see, sense, feel, or know that this bright white light, this prana, this life force, this energy that we draw in with the breath is drawing into the heart space, is lighting it up. And then with every exhale, that light is starting to expand. So every inhale starts to light up the center of the chest, the center of the heart so that it's glowing. And every exhale, that light starts to expand, expand past the shoulders, in front of you and behind you. Expand all the way down past your feet and above your head, so that you are cocooned in your mind's eye in this beautiful white light this space of grace. And I'm just gonna lead you now through a short connection meditation, our vertical axis. So from that white light in your heart center, on your next inhale, I want you to imagine that you're drawing that light down, drawing the light with your awareness down through the heart, through the belly. Using every inhale to draw that light down, down into the pelvis, the pelvic bowl, the roots. Drawing that light down, down through the thighs, the legs, the knees. Drawing that light down through the calves. 
all the way to the ankles. Through the top of the feet, through all of the toes, right down to the soles of the feet. And then I want you to imagine that that light is simply flowing out through the soles of your feet, reaching down through the floor, all the way down to the point of connection with the earth, with the soil. And imagining that light reaching down, continuing in its journey all the way down through the soil, through the rocks, through the layers of the earth, in whatever way you see, sense, or feel it. Maybe like roots, maybe like shards of light, maybe like a thread or tendrils. And this light is gonna reach the very center of the earth where there's the same glowing orb of light, white light that there is at your heart center. And as you take your next deep inhale now, feeling that connection, your heart connected to the heart of the earth. And that energy now connected, feeling your body relaxed, held, supported by the energy of the earth below you that you're part of, connected to. And using your next inhale to draw that energy back up, back up through those roots, those tendrils, those shards of light, back up through the soles of your feet, back up through your ankles, your calves, your knees, your thighs, inhaling that light all the way back up, through your pelvis, through your core, your torso, all the way back up into your heart center. As that light continues to draw up, all the way up to your throat, washing over your hands, your arms, your shoulders, drawing that beautiful white light up now through the throat, into the head, the insides of the ears, the mouth, behind the nose, the inside of the skull, the pineal gland, the third eye, drawing that light up now until that light shoots up through the crown of the head. Seeing, sense, feeling, or simply knowing that that light now is making its way up. Up past the top of the room you find yourself in. Up into the sky, past any clouds, up past our atmosphere's stratosphere, into the cosmos itself, all the way up past the stars, past the blackness, to a place of pure light. To all that is, to source to one love as you take a deep breath in and feeling that connection from your heart to the heart of that paternal energy all the way above you. And again, feeling that connection now below and above. And on your next inhale, allowing that energy, that source, that love to be drawn back into your being back through the crown of your head, washing over each and every of the trillions of cells in your body, drawing back down through the head, the third eye, through the throat, into your heart. Feeling that light bathing all of the space within your being. Taking the next three breaths to breathe in, almost as though every inhale you're lighting up like a bulb turning on your whole being. Vibrating with that lightness. <sighs> Vibrating with that love. And allowing your awareness to expand with a sense of freedom. Space. And safety in the fact that you are so held, so loved so supported and when you're ready starting to wriggle your fingers wriggle your toes bring your hands back together and rub the palms together make them nice and toasty warm get some energy between them and then place those hands over the closed eyes block out any light and blink open the eyes into your internal darkness your inner world the realm of your infinite possibilities look up look down to the right and to the left take a big circle around in one direction and then the other. And then gently blinking the eyes as you slowly draw the hands away from the face, coming back into the here and the now. 
Wow. <laughs> that was so good. It was even better than the one we uh, went to the online retreat. <laughs> it was oh, amazing. bless you. Thank the problem you with so it much. is you don't want to leave that place. I so know. Then let's just stay here. <laughs> yeah, you feel so light hearted as well. Like it's like all of your even if we, whenever you're feeling uh, really heaviness around your heart or whatever overthinking, it just it just takes away in that moment. Mm. It's really hard to explain. It's just really yeah. hard to explain. It's like a magical cure that no hardly anyone know, knew about until yeah, like, so, true. <laughs> so true. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, okay, so obviously okay so we know that you know you do amazing meditations and uh, and um you're oh god you're an amazing teacher um so let's go back to the beginning um what were you like as a child how was your upbringing well, it's so interesting actually thank you like i feel like so much of our life is like almost a remembering isn't it it's kind of an unlearning and how i was as a child is probably more like i am now than the last kind of th like 20 years in between so as a kid I was super sensitive um I was really blessed with an amazing childhood actually for, for for quite some time loved my brother we were like best mates you know um I just have a lot with, I grew up in the country so just a lot of running around and playing innocence um I totally believed in fairies when I was little a lot of adventures trying to find like hidden crystals in uh, quarries and like just so much make-believe stuff going on but I could definitely read energy so I without knowing that maybe that was an unusual thing 100% knew how people were feeling in their body you know we'd go into like woods and be able to see sort of dancing energies we'd go into new houses and not be able to stay in a room even in some of our rooms in our house would know when a dark energy was there and would lose my shit mm. so yeah super sensitive really just happy happy kid very playful and just loved life having the freedom of being in the country i was very very blessed in that sense very blessed very grateful mm, amazing um you said like you you were seeing energies at that time did you um at some point think it was it was uh it was crazy or you're losing your you're, you're different than other kids um yeah, it's a really great question. Like, I never cognitively thought, oh, not everyone can do this. Mm. Like, I just assumed that was normal because my mum was really um, kind of accepting of it. Like, apparently, like when I was two, I literally like sat, stood up in my cot and like screamed, like staring mm. at nothing in the corner of the room. But then I remember at the age of like 16 going into our attic and this dark energy moving through me, literally towards and through me, I screamed, sprinted downstairs and my mum put her hand up and told it to fuck off. <laughs> so like, it was like very accepted, yeah. but I would say there was like, there must have been a knowing in me because I never really shared it with anyone, never mm. really told anyone at school. And what did happen, it was very subtle, but I kind of noticed that my sensitivity at school with friends didn't serve me. It wasn't yeah. necessarily the spiritual stuff, but they're so connected, right? Like if you're very sensitive, you're going to be sensitive often energetically and physically and my sensitivity often meant I got hurt you know like I, yeah. I made other people's stuff about me I got upset quite easily and so I sort of was starting to make these decisions that my sensitivity but also some of the gifts that came with that was like always it was an absolute weakness mm -hmm. and so yeah I didn't think necessarily I was different I thought I wasn't as good or there was something wrong with me and I started to shut it down yeah, and I, I think a lot of people who are highly sensitive or empaths go through the same thing. And mm. uh, and I guess like when uh peop when kids actually say, Oh, I'm seeing this person and you can't see it, I I truly believe that they do see something. They do see is it maybe perhaps spirit or energy like you, you like you mentioned, but we kind of brush it aside and then we get kind of programmed into thinking uh, well, you know, it just be, must be in my head when, when it isn't. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We do start to doubt it and you it kind of gets put into that box of make-believe, you know, like, oh, well, you used to believe in fairies and Santa and all that stuff can go in there too. Mm. Mm. And so it's like, oh, but to grow up means 
stopping all of that and it's yeah it's so dismissive but I, I mean I remember doing loads of hocus pocus stuff I don't know why it's like I remember trying to do when my grandpa died I was nine and I started doing a Ouija board to talk to him really like what the hell? <laughs> I remember getting told off at school because they're like you're not allowed to do the Ouija board at school like that's kind of like that's Scary. like that's just not okay exactly. <laughs> I was like, oh, so I used to go and do it at my friend's attic. And I look back and I was like, God, that was a bit witchy for like a nine-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I guess like in uh, movies these days don't help because they make it into some sort of horrifying, scary movies. But yeah. in reality, it's not that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, so and this idea that there's like good and evil, like there's dark forces. I totally don't believe in that. Like I mm. really believe in the law of one, like that, like only love is real everything mm. else is illusion mm, absolutely totally agree mm. with that totally agree with that um so you know obviously were you like were you spiritual at that point were you spiritual um grow, grown up in a spiritual household no I wouldn't say no it wasn't like explicit and accepted like my mom had like a deep knowing and our mm. conversations have got more spiritual as I've become more spiritual as an adult so she had a knowing and an understanding, but actually, bizarrely, it was a very conservative household. Like, I used to go to church. My grandma was very strict. There was a lot around etiquette and, you know, doing what you ought to do. It was very kind of rigid and stoic and British in that sense, actually. Mm. Having said that, I lived near Glastonbury. And so I remember filling my room with incense and like yin yang symbols and mm. little angels and you know, kind of intuitively being drawn and crystals and being drawn to all of that, but never labeling it as or identifying myself as that because there was no space for it. It was like, no, you're Christian. And I kind of went to, you know, Bible studies and all of that. And some of the morals made sense to me, but it never really sat well. But mm. yeah. Okay. So I know I'm aware that when we were talking about um, your awakening, so you had awakening as well. So what was the series of events that led you to your awakening? What happened to you? Sure. So like I said, like my family upbringing was very kind of, it's quite British and stoic and my personality type was very much like, right. Okay. Well, let's be the good girl. And so there was all of that, like, you know, achiever type mentality. So that was kind of that, peppered through my university years and as I was going into my 20s and I really felt like oh we have this perfect little family unit me and my brother and my mum and my dad and we all love each other and it's great and I'm gonna do really well and da 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 and then aged 20 um my brother was on his gap year a couple of months in and he was on a motorbike with a friend on the back and uh Laurie came around the corner on the wrong side of the road and he died he was he was hit the guy on the back of his motorbike survived because of the way he like basically threw himself under this this lorry to save his friend and that was my worst like that was my worst nightmare that he was my favorite person in the whole world and I was like there was a weird stuff that happened before it where I I actually said to a friend a week before he died if I ever lost my brother I don't know what I would do like I think I'd lose my mind he's the most important person to me and I was like why did I say that a week before um so that happened and I made the choice in my head so that's, that was the first thing that like shook my reality. You know, it broke it. It broke this perfect little image I have of everything. But rather than facing it or allowing that to change me, you know, that you talk about often, you know, the heart that breaks open. Hmm. I did the opposite. I refused to look at it. I was like, the worst thing in the world has happened to me. I'm not going to let it ruin my life. Like it's already shit enough. That was my that was my mentality. And I think the way that I did that was I shifted into my masculine, I disassociated, and I spent the next almost a decade swinging between kind of disassociation, driving really hard, thinking that if I could just achieve and get to where I wanted to get to, I'd feel better. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that, which was all of the pain that I refused to look at, was smashing me in the face. So I was having panic attacks. I had generalized anxiety disorder. I didn't even know what that was. But um, I was doing quite a lot of drugs and drinking. And so it was this weird pendulum swing that I was living of like trying to hold all my shit together, not even knowing what it meant to sit and feel your feelings, mm. being there for everyone else, trying to prove that I could do it. And internally, just, it was so painful. You know, I don't think I realized oh, how much pain I was in until I look back now and compare it mm. 
to, to how I feel on the day to day now. So that was the first thing. The second thing, about six years after that, my parents' marriage started to break down um, without going into all of the details, obviously, because it's their, their privacy. I do think losing my brother was a big part of that. Maybe it would have happened anyway, but it was super hard because it was a very messy divorce and I was there in the middle without my brother suddenly. So that was like this perfect little, you know, my, if we go back to my childhood, right. My everything was this perfect little unit that I had Mm -hmm. and then lost my favorite person. Parents destroy each other. In the meantime, I hear the worst things about, you know, so caught in the crossfire, I'm still in the mindset of I'll solve this. I'll hold it together. I'll keep achieving. Don't look at my emotions. Still not on a healing path. So the universe is like, okay, carry on. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, I'll just get a great relationship, start my own family. It's all good. Mm-hmm. Fall in love with someone, move to Canada, off I go. The universe <laughs> is like, <laughs> <laughs> do, do you actually even like? Do you like you? Do you like this person? What's going on? Still, so I'm still running, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, this relationship is very toxic ends up being I mean not surprising you know considering I'm still running Mm. um life's your mirror I think maybe they're in the same boat it was that typical empath narcissist um uh what do you call it kind of structure Mm. anyway long story short ends up being complete shit show of a year I am absolutely on my knees emotionally physically mentally the whole works and it just reaches this point where I've come back to the UK for my best friend's wedding with him got two weeks where he's going to meet all of my family after I've lived in his neck of, you know, his part of the world for a year. And the next morning he just gets up and walks out in the middle of the country, tries to take the keys to the car. I was like, I'm going back to, to Canada. I can't be fucked to meet your family. Screw this. Don't come back. Hmm. And I was like, it just broke me. Absolutely broke me. It was after already a, a succession of, I mean, if anyone's been in a very toxic relationship, hmm. they'll know the, how destabilizing techniques like gaslighting and ghosting Mm. and all of that has on you anyway. And this had been ramping up over a year. So I was already just so lost within it. So Mm. lost as to who I even was at this point, I was really losing myself. So that he left and I just couldn't do it anymore. Mm. Um, And that was the point that I broke. Mm. Um, And it was also the point that I started to awaken because everything that I thought, all of that external stuff that I thought defined me, that my identity was attached to, the partner, the, the high-flying career, the nice apartment, the, the salary, um, the group of friends, the, the holidays I had, all of those things were no longer possible, were no longer mine. Mm. And I was left being like, a, what the fuck do I do now? I was, I'd always planned six months ahead. You know, I'm an achiever type, right? I know mm. what I'm doing. There's control freak going on. Mm. Ego is massively in control. And suddenly that, that wasn't an option. I had to surrender. The universe had tried whispering to me for years. It got to the point of shouting. And then I think the universe just went, nope, <laughs> plonked me outside of the situation. Yeah. I ended up coming to Turkey to my mom's house. And um, that was the start of my, what I called at the time, rude awakening. Mm-hmm. Mm, so I know losing someone you love is a traumatic experience itself and the pain is unbearable and I remember when my dad passed away um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a pain that you, you can't describe it um, how did you react when you found out about your brother's death and um, how did it impact your life um, so when I found out, I was, I remember where I was, I was in the, the, the library in Manchester and I got a text from my dad saying, hey, I need to speak to you. Where are you? Mm. And that was the first moment when like, my stomach dropped because he would always just pick up the phone and talk to me. And I just thought, I thought my, honestly, I thought my grandma had died, like mm. his mum in her 90s. So I was like, oh shit, grandma's died. And you have that like horrible moment where you're just like, okay. So I tell him that I'm in the library. He's like, right, I'm driving to you. And I was like, oh fuck, it must be bad, you know? So I'm like preparing myself for that. Um, and so I go out and meet him and I get into the car. And there's something that never prepares you to see your parents break down. Like they're your parents, you know, like they're not. Yeah. So that seeing he was broken and he was like, okay get in the car and then he was like raw that's my name my brother has died and I was like nah I refuse to believe it 
And he was like, we need to go down to Somerset because my our family home was down the south of the UK. My mum was down there. He was like, we need to go there now. And he could barely drive. He was like on the verge of a panic attack. It's a four and a half hour drive. He was in that state most of the way. Half the time I'd have to drive for him. And the only way that I survived that is in my head. I was like, nah, like there has to be like, a, he might not be dead, maybe still in a hospital. Are we sure? You know, where's that come from? It was almost like my brain was like fact checking. It was like that. It can't just happen like that, that this person that's like your whole world just isn't there. Mm. Like it just didn't compute. It was like cognitive dissonance. Like, so I was in denial and it slowly started to register on the way down. But I don't know if you had this. It's almost like your brain can only process mm. them not being around in like snippets. Yeah. So it's like, okay, let's, let's accept that reality that's like a tidal wave of grief. And you're like, nope, let's close that again. And so that's kind of what happens, isn't it? You sort of go through these periods of opening up to that new, this new track that you're suddenly on without them in your life anymore mm. and feel into it. And I think someone described it to me, like if your life is like a box, when you have grief to begin with, it's like the box is full with this big ball that takes it's like the whole width of the box and it takes it all up and there's like almost no escaping this this ball that is your grief so you bump up against it all the time and you literally like trying to live is really fucking hard at the beginning but that ball gets smaller and smaller and so when you bump up against it it still feels just as painful yeah five years on ten years on but it doesn't you don't bump up against it as much and i honestly can say that that made sense to me and resonated for me um but how it's evolved is I truly believe grief and love, like grief is a portal to love. Mm. We live in a polarity existence. When I really drop into missing my brother, when it hits me, even now, and those tears start to come and I, it hurts, it's so physical, isn't it? It really hurts. I feel his love bigger, stronger. I feel him closer than ever. So mm. it's almost like to connect with him, I have to go into that. Mm. That love and grief are two sides of the same coin. It affected my life. How did I cope? I decided to try and look after everyone else. Mm. I looked after his ex-girlfriend, I was there for my parents. We were, as a family, were there for all of his friends, probably at our own expense. Mm. For We had to go out and get his body. We looked after the friends he was traveling with, you know. So I very much focused on that, everyone else. And then I broke down intermittently in between all of that. Uh, so I think it massively destabilized me. Um, yeah I, I I get that as well like <clears throat> when my dad passed away uh, for a couple of days you know we, we get a lot of people in a house like you know um, you know just to pay respects and I was the one who was just joking and laughing not realizing that my dad just passed away and they were looking at me like her dad just passed away and she's laughing and joking as in like she's she's got some sort of like celebration or something um, but when they left that's when it kind of really hit me and I broke down like it was just the pain was intense and then it went again like it mm. went again and then it came back again like a couple of days again so it's it's I totally get you the point where you know it doesn't open up uh constantly it just opens up in like little piece like little glimpses yeah definitely. yeah totally yeah um so I'm I you know I know I went through a dark night as soul um, after uh, after all of my experiences. So I know you have to some extent as well. Um, so what is like dark night of the soul? And how can people navigate through it to, you know, to our listeners who don't know what it is? Or maybe they're going through it and not realizing that it's dark night of the soul. Interesting. Great question. So how, how to recognize what it is and how to navigate it. So it literally felt to me like I couldn't see a way forward. So it was almost like someone had pulled down like a black curtain in front of me and I couldn't see where my life was going to go. Nothing mm. made sense. It was a real like, you know, like when the rugs pulled out from underneath you, it's kind of that feeling because essentially what's happening, if we will look at it kind of from a neuroscience perspective or a psychology perspective is an ego identity is dying. Who mm. you thought you were in relationship to other important aspects of your life that make up your identity can no longer exist because the circumstances have changed. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's happening psychologically. What's happening spiritually is you're evolving. Yeah. And it's that chrysalis to butterfly, right? You were a caterpillar. Yeah. Now you're in a chrysalis. You're going to come out as a butterfly. But what happens in the chrysalis is you literally turn to mush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. 
it's a great question to say how can you navigate it and I honestly surrender mm. you know it life is happening for you to you the deeper that you can lean in and build up faith that whatever is this like there's some great truths that I learned that have been the, my like life jacket I suppose through those dark nights of the soul one is life is always trying to help you you know life is benevolent so anything that gets taken away is going to be replaced with something better if you can believe that and hold steadfast to that you can let go of things and the easier that you can let go of things that are being stripped off you the smoother your journey is going to be oh yeah the more ease and grace beautifully said because um in a way it is your ego death is a part of you is dying that needs to die in, in order for you to involve i think it's you you just you just said it perfectly then um so you know now i'm aware that you uh you spent some time in india um so and you met dalai dalai lama oh my god seriously um yeah it's, what was that experience like for you oh my god that was nuts so that was part <laughs> of it so, so break down moved to my mom's dark night of the soul didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. Like people describe it to me as like, just be like a kid. Like yeah. a kid will be playing in the field and then parents will be like, no, 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 we've got to go inside now. And there's like this willingness. They have no idea what's coming. They're just willing to just go with the flow. If it, the more we can be like children, the easier life will be. So that's what it was like. I kind of gave up, I surrendered. I said, universe, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do over to you. <laughs> and then there was this weird thing where I was like, I just need to learn how to meditate. I think that's gonna help me. I need to learn like what's unconscious in me, started meditating a bit. And I was like, where can I learn to meditate properly? Well, the Dalai Lama knows how to meditate. I'll go to where he is. This is literally how simplistic my mind was and how naive. <laughs> like, where is the Dalai Lama? Fuck, he's not even in Tibet. Okay, where is this place in India? Okay, how do I get there? And that's how it started. So I booked to go to this Tibetan Buddhist meditation course, 10 days mm. in Himal Prakash, Dharamkot in India. And that turned into like this three month journey. Wow. So I go to this thing. And I'm like, okay, what does it involve? Okay, it's 10 days of silence. I thought, great, because I really don't want to talk to anyone at the moment anyway. Life shit. Like, I really don't want to chat about it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, silence sounds fab. And then I was like, okay, food's meant to be good. That's important to me. Fine. And I'm going to learn how to meditate. Great. I'm on a plane, off I go. <laughs> and um, all the way, I was like, God, it'd just be so cool to meet the Dalai Lama. And like, mm -hmm. during Dark Night of the Soul, I don't know, it's different for everyone as to when this comes in. But for me, I really started... I was like, there was like a crazy thirst to learn how the world was working because the way I thought it worked didn't make any sense anymore. So I was like reading all this stuff and I was like, God, I just, everything I'd, I was reading a book on Dalai Lama and they were like, you know, he just exudes such compassion. It's amazing to be in his presence, yada, yada, yada. So I was writing in my journal being like, dear universe, I was like starting to learn law of attraction stuff. Dear universe, it would be so amazing. Thank you so much for letting me meet the Dalai Lama. It'd be so cool, you know. And so I was writing this in my journal for maybe three days, but we were doing this 10 day course and we didn't leave the kind of, um, oh, I don't know what you call it, like the residence of this yeah. course. And the Dalai Lama is like in his own temple, the other end of Dharamkot. It's the winter, apparently he doesn't give speeches in the winter, it's not his jam. So like, there was no chance. And I was like, okay, but something in me was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wake up day three of this 10 day meditation course, go down, start a meditation. They were like, right guys, bit of a change of plan today, completely out the blue, really unexpected. The Dalai Lama is gonna give a talk. So we're gonna go to that and you get, you'll get to meet him. Hmm. And I was like, what the actual work? <laughs> so that's how it happened. We end up going to his temple, he gave a talk. He walked in and we were kind of um, past the railings and we were passing him, you know, like scarves and stuff like this. And I locked eyes with him and if you've ever been in the presence of a ma like a master soul oh, yeah. it's really hard to describe but you know hmm. his love poured through every part of me and i i mean i just i was just grinning like an absolute idiot like a cheshire cat just like, <laughs> like and i was like that all day just on a high so that's how that happened i asked yeah. the universe the universe delivered yeah it's 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 amazing because um this there's not when you meet these like very high um vibrational souls you can feel and you can sense the energy of them and you just completely yeah yeah and i met a couple of a few um very not very like um in a terms of very like it, well known but you can even sense it around and, and you know 
that these yeah. people that you're around oh my god their light is that it's 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 you know um shining the room <laughs> where you are yeah um that's that's incredible experience so um you know, I really want to just continue with this this podcast because it's, it's just incredible hearing you and your experiences. But obviously, like, you know, we're um, we're um, running out of time. Um, so uh, can you tell us like about the work that you are doing right now? Yeah, sure. So I think India started for me. The question that was like my red thread through that dark night of the soul, through that sort of learning stage was what lights me up. I wanted to come back. I realized I was just so unhappy. I wanted to live a life where I felt that feeling of joy that I knew I had as a kid. Um, so I followed what, what was lighting me up and it was so much to like heed as past. So I just explored all these things that lit me up, Reiki and yoga and meditation and breath work and drawing. And I drew mandalas for like six months. And like, wow. so did all of these things. And, and what, it was like an unfolding. I don't think I could have planned it, but it's led me towards what I do now and it really downloaded in India like my dharma my purpose my soul's purpose to be here is to help bring people back to balance mm -hmm. balance between and this might make sense to some people and, and not to others and I can always explain it if you want to but that internal balance of masculine and feminine energies that balance between what we do outwardly in the world and what are in our inner worlds that balance between connecting down to the earth and up to to mm -hmm. the ascended energies all about coming back to balance because when we're in balance we can live in harmony with each other we can live in harmony with the world and that's what's it's missing right now that's why we're destroying this world we're in this primitive cancer-like brain mm. so my work is all about bringing people back to balance and we and i do that by reconnecting them to like we did in the meditation it's that vertical access yeah. you're connected into your higher mm. you're grounding down and as above so below the deeper you can ground the higher you can go to connect your higher self your soul mm. the higher aspect of yourself and that's my work really helping people break through all the shit like i got pulled through kicking and screaming <laughs> i help people yeah. fast track that and do it yeah. loads easier yeah, less yeah. pain less suffering to to connect to their soul's purpose and their power and, and freedom because it brings so much joy yeah. and so much love into your life that that is incredible because you know obviously um i love hearing stories like yours um so many people they may go through adversities and they may go through uh, they live like their life unconsciously for a while but then they have the spiritual awakening that leads them on a completely different path completely new life and it's not a life of i'm being selfish it's a life of helping people it just comes yes. naturally yeah yeah because yeah. yeah, that's the truth right you realize that actually when you're living in service in a way that's in balance and is serving you too mm. but that's what I mean that's what lights me up I can be having a really shit day and then do a healing on someone yeah. and it lifts like there's like borrowed benefits it lifts us both up because we're mm. both connecting to that higher place mm. and also like it's a spiral path right it's not like you're awakened job done like yeah. cool I'm now living as an angel you know like <laughs> yeah. no, like it's a spiral path so we keep yeah you know, breaking our glass ceiling and the job of the ego is to keep us safe. So we always are smashing through the next glass ceiling mm. when we, if we, if we follow a path of our soul's growth and at each stage, I think it's helpful to understand what's trying to pull you back. And that's mm. where I love working with people's subconscious minds, love undoing the programming, taking the soul's gift, bringing love back in, you know, like it just makes it so much easier. And I, I'm quite impatient. I'm an Aries. So the faster that I can do that with people and bring in love, that's, that feels really good to me. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Um, you, I believe you have a program as well. Uh, would you like to tell the audience about? Yeah, thanks so much. So my program is called uh, Breakthrough Program and it is exactly that. It's helping people that, you know, if you're at that stage where you feel like you've kind of gone through awakening, a dark night of the soul, and you're doing everything that you think's right, you know, you're doing all the physical stuff, maybe you've got a yoga practice, you're doing your meditation, you're eating a bit healthier, and you're doing everything on the kind of physical, mental, maybe even emotional levels, and you still feel like there's a missing piece, something's still not adding up, and you're still, life is, you know, you're wanting apples and you're still getting oranges kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, or a pattern keeps repeating, that's when I come in because the missing piece is there's subconscious programs running and I'm going to reconnect you to your soul and bust through that. So that's the breakthrough. It's not only do I work one-to-one -one with people to break through some of that. I also do their soul plans reading, which is 
phenomenal because you connect to all of the energies your soul has given you in this life um, and give people the tools as to how they can bring themselves back to balance, how they can break through their own limiting beliefs themselves as they move forward. So yeah, I absolutely love the program. We're opening up again um, in November. So launch is coming up soon. So if you're interested, do get in touch. But yeah, it's been mm. phenomenal so far. People describe to me like it's a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, it's brought them back home to themselves. It's brought them a sense of peace. Um, they didn't know what was missing. You know, they didn't know that the soul part was what was missing. Mm. And that, that's what I bring in. It's that soul's perspective. It's that reconnection. Okay, beautiful. So anyone who wants to get in touch with Amy, uh, we were going to be talking, uh, we'll, we'll, um, I'll ask her about the contact details afterward, afterwards, but I want to go through a rapid fire oh! questions with you first. <laughs> I do this with everyone. I love this bit. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so nervous with this bit. All right. Oh my God. Right. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm totally going to grill you right now. <laughs> All right, you ready? No, but go for it. Okay, okay, okay cool. It's, it's not that hard. So it's, it's only mini questions. Don't worry. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. What is your definition of God? Everything, all that is, source, spirit. Love. Okay, beautiful. How do you define religion and spirituality? Oh, such a good question. Religion for me is spirituality put into a box with institutionalized dogma and for the purpose of control and power. Spirituality is a person's own experience of access to God without any externalized rules or rigor. Beautiful. Oh my God. I love how you just uh, described this. Amazing. Um, what is the lesson that took, took you longest to learn? I'm still learning it. Let <laughs> how to let go of what? Oh isn't my god! And when to let go? Yeah, th I think that's a lesson everyone's <laughs> going through. I think it's a lifetime, even lifetimes journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So, do you believe there is an end to healing? It depends how you define healing, but in this lifetime, no. Mm -hmm. Okay um okay the one last one the world needs more of what kindness beautiful oh thank you so much amy um anyway okay there's one last question that i want to ask you um if there is one message that you would like to share with someone who's going through adversity right now who's going through a dark night of soul or spiritual awakening and lost in life, what would you tell them right now? Yeah, so I'm going to paraphrase this quote from Matt Khan, but it is so powerful and so true. I, I would invite you to ask yourself, what if the greatest challenge you've ever been given, all well, that shit you're going through, is in fact the greatest opportunity you've ever been given for growth? and for change and for everything that's up ahead so flip it on its head every challenge is the seed of opportunity so look for what that opportunity is mm -hmm. beautifully said and your dark times make you the person you're going to become in the next five ten years so just keep riding the wave guys um mm. okay so uh, how can people contact you um all the normal channels really so on facebook i mean are you going to put this underneath on um yes, you can write yes, as well. yeah. so yeah Amy, facebook is uh, Amy is amy at the love amy the beloved company uh, my instagram handle is amy underscore beloved underscore company and then it's the same my website is um www.thebelovedcompany.co.uk awesome get in touch with her guys she is incredible and i absolutely loved interviewing you today thank you amy. so much i loved it too it's been thank awesome you. thank you is there any last message that you would like to say I'm getting a really clear download in my head. So all I want to say to you guys is like the universe is fair, it's balanced and it's loving. So anytime that you're being pulled in, a, in the direction of pain, darkness, challenge, adversity, know that you are going to pendulum swing as far back the other way. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's like, yeah, it's a swing. It's a pendulum swing. So the darker the 
the place is that you're at know that it's because you're going to go even higher yeah. in the light and the happiness the other the other side of it so everything is in balance and have faith yeah i totally agree thank you so much thank you so much amy for coming thank on so this much. podcast <laughs> thank you oh it's been so fun thank you so much yeah. bye Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website madhyasosan.com. com if you would like to watch this episode then head over to my youtube channel mads corner m a d z corner if you enjoyed this episode then please do rate and share this with your family and friends thank you once again and i will see you on the next episode